Mm. Yeah. Am I competent? I don't know. I'm not perfect, but I do okay. Yeah. Um, how about the crazy patients that we deal with? What if they get violent? I get that stuff all the time. How do you handle that? So just on Monday, things almost got real. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. This patient, I, he's uh, strung out on meth, and he came in. He came to my clinic at the Phoenix, and I wanted him to slow down. He thought I was telling him to shut up. So he storms out of the room. I don't know where he went. I tried to follow him. He went into the courtyard. He came back in, and I met him almost head on. And he went at me like this. You telling me to shut up? He, he, got, he got about this close. So I know what we're told what to do, not to touch any patients. But if I'm by myself, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. Um, so I basically backed up, and, and he walked away. But I want to show you what would have happened. <laughs> so give me a big guy. Who's a big guy? Who's that bald guy who's in our, our service? Oh, yeah. okay. Big guy. Any big guy? All right, come on. Uh, oh, I'd like to volunteer. Yeah. Not going to hurt you. Because <laughs> we're not about hurting patients. We keep things safe. We keep ourselves safe. So just come at me and, you know, Go slow, but like, you're going to connect, right? Either hand. So. Oh. And now I have them. Try to punch me? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay. <laughs> I guess I need more training. Yeah, it didn't work. But, yeah, I guess I need more training. <laughs> See, it's an imperfect world. And that was a real life example. And as doctors, we're going to run into real life examples all the time. We think we know how to handle it. And it turns out he's showing me that I need more um, training. And that's fine. It's not going to be perfect. And that's how I want you to approach everything in life, including psychiatry. Like if you think of a consult, you have questions, you just realize you're not going to be perfect. This demonstration was um, completely unplanned and it didn't turn out as well as I wanted it to turn out. So, um, and you're gonna run into that, that's okay. So, our objectives today are to define competence and capacity. And then we'll go into a little bit of ethics and legal significance, but we're not going to focus too much on that. And that's, I, I made corrections to this. Um, this must be the wrong set of slides. Hmm. Well, I would you go with this. We're going to apply real life examples.
start off with a question. This is just a um, kind of an extreme case, but it's fun to think about. There's this condition called apoptenophilia. People who want stumps for legs and arms. And it's a real condition. People, people who are sane, people who are otherwise competent or have the capacity to make it their own decisions, grow up somehow in their childhood, start thinking that their life would be better without arms or legs or if they had a stump. There was actually a movie made about it and a documentary too. So <clears throat> it's actually a variety of body integrity identity disorder. And I don't think in the DSM-5 we're even going to name um, apoptonophilia as a separate disease or mental illness. It's just going to be categorized as a subset of body integrity identity disorder. Anyways, we have this 65-year-old man who comes into your office, who has an obviously healthy limb. He, he's lived 65 years. He's worked his life, all his life. He's, got, he's raised children. He's lived an otherwise very healthy and normal life. And he wants to have a limb removed. He's dealt with this all his life. He's thought about it. He's, uh, read about it, he's trying to get treatment for it, but he's just not happy with his present body, and he longs for a peg, for a leg. That's really what he wants, and this is real. This is not um, made up. So, I don't know, what are your first thoughts as a surgeon? Any surgeons in here? No surgeons. <coughs> We won't get too much into like the ethics of it. We're gonna get it just into evaluating capacity, but just for thought's sake, would it be wrong for a surgeon to perform the amputation? Would it be, I guess, yeah, I'll just leave it as would it be wrong? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, breast augmentation, breast reduction. Yeah, how would it be any different? That's an interesting question, yeah. It's functional. It's a functional limb yeah. that you're removing. It's perfectly healthy. Go ahead. Well, I'm just gonna make a remark that statistically speaking, amputees, even ones from traumatic and non-systemic illness, live shorter lifespans because of the additional strain that it puts on the heart. They have a higher propensity for cardiovascular disease. So, okay, so the vessels. You could, you could make the argument that you are doing harm, that it is not purely well, cosmetic. Yeah. I mean, you don't even have to go that far. You're, you're taking a perfectly good arm away. That is one. Right? So, yeah. And then they do live shorter lives. But for, for you, um, what's your first name? Joe. Joe. So, Joe, would you perform the surgery, though? Uh, it would depend on the entire situation, especially his course with the head, because what good is he at risk for suicide if he doesn't get surgery because of the ongoing uh, psychiatric issues? Um, what's his quality of life? Mm -hmm. okay, we, okay. Just because we made someone live longer doesn't necessarily mean it's they're happy with their life or a good quality of life. That's a good and point, too. Right, so how many happy years do you have versus how many years you have altogether unhappy that you have this extra limb? So those are good questions. And I don't have answers to those. I don't need an answer right now. But these are just kind of things to think about as you go about uh, being a doctor. It's an art. Uh, da, da, da. So let's jump right into capacity and competence. And then we'll go back to the case and apply our rules of thumb and our scale of um, rating competence and um, well, actually, we're just going to rate capacity. I, see, I, it's, it's such a hard concept that I even misspoke just now. Really, the only thing we rate is capacity as psychiatrists. Competence is something that the courts <coughs> decide. We psychiatrists 
doctors do not. We psychiatrists and us doctors in all together, because uh, we're not the only ones who have the sole monopoly on rating capacity, on determining capacity. Every single one of you who have a medical license here is able to determine capacity, and that's very important for you guys to understand. You don't really need us 95% of the time. We're happy to help, don't get us wrong. And we'll, we'll show you uh, the steps to determine capacity. So what is it? Capacity is the ability to understand information relevant to a decision, a specific treatment decision, and for the patient to reasonably appreciate any foreseeable, reasonable consequences of that particular decision to go forward or to not go forward with the treatment. All right? That's the ability to understand. So highlight the word ability. It's an ability, capability, capacity. Whereas competence, whereas capacity is the ability to uh, have something and you have degrees of it, you have capacity and they come in degrees, competence is a particular characteristic of a person or a property. And that's all just a lot of jumbo words. In reality, it's just, you're, you are, it's a black and white, either or. You're either competent or you're not. There's no degrees, it's black and white. Once the court say you're not competent, you're not competent for that particular decision, for that particular area of your life. There's no degrees. So if we put the definitions side by side, the words read 90% the same because from the word, the degree to which, from this line on, it's the same. Being able to understand information relevant to a treatment decision and appreciate the foreseeable consequence. Did I just read that about capacity? So what's the difference? It's the degree to which you're able to. That's the only difference and that's capacity, and that's what we do as doctors. The courts take care of the second one. Any questions about that so far? Okay, I think everybody's got it. Degrees. And it's because it's in degrees, that is actually how we can evaluate capacity. And capacity can change over time. So that brings me to an interesting real life case. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you my background. Uh, I graduated Western U in 2002. I started a family practice residency. I was more than miserable. I hated it. I was not good at it. Anyways, uh, he wants me to be all professional. And, but I, I like to talk the way I like to talk. Since I'm, anyways. I, I didn't like family practice and I was not good at it and I resigned from it and at that point I was so soured on the whole thing I wasn't even going to go back to be a doctor anymore but luckily um, psychiatry is my calling and, and that but between 2002 and 2003 I was in a family practice residency I dropped out and then I finished the internship separately from the family practice residency and I, that's what gave me the ability to have a license since 2005 and then I'd be in private practice down in Long Beach in psychiatry with a mentor that I met during medical school. So I have been in private practice. So some of the cases I'm gonna talk about come from my private practice experience. This particular case, I've been seeing this patient. He's an elderly gentleman. He's demented as can be, although you couldn't tell when you talked to him because his wife sat next to him and did all the talking and he seemed normal. He fooled me the very first time. I thought he was fine. I didn't realize how really demented he was. Um, so I've been treating him for two and a half years, and now they want to address end-of-life issues, the will. She wanted me to write a letter stating that he understands what a will is, that he could have the capacity, this letter goes to the lawyer, um, to decide that he wants to sign 
his will, like the will that, you know, the lawyer wanted a letter from me that this elderly gentleman has the capacity to understand what a will is, that he's not just blinding, blindly, because he will. He threw the paper in front of him, he'll sign it. So he, the lawyer wants to know it's not that. And they needed me to write a letter. Anybody think I could do it? Anybody think that doctors have that uh, under their scope of practice? Yeah. But how do you go about it? This guy is, he hardly knows his name. I mean, he does. His MMS e-score, I did it right then, was like a six or a seven. So what do I do? Um, I've known these people for a long time. Any, uh, well, just think about that for a moment. Any ideas? Okay. So, because capacity could change over time, we could, could we catch him at a good time? That maybe he has the capacity and bring the lawyer in and sign it right there and then that when he has the capacity to understand, we sign it. Yeah. And once again, off the record, his, uh, I don't know, in a professional talk, I suppose we don't disclose that we actually think this way. But you think about the big picture, and actually it's supported by my, um, by the slide I have, that we do have some, some discretion. Because is this decision gonna hurt the patient? Like, is, is, is the patient come in with a gold digger wife and who is this um, you know, trophy wife at one point that he got and is just trying to take his money and steal money from his kids? I think about that. You're not supposed to, I suppose. But I think about it. It's in my mind. So the situation with him is he's, he's been married to her 30, 40 years. This is a dedicated <coughs> wife who takes care of him. I mean, he does so well because she takes care of him. So I know there, she's not trying to steal his money. Right? So eventually, the bottom line is, I found a period of time when I was able to ask him in general, I said, I'll just call him Bob. Bob, um, do you understand what a will is? Uh, the, the, lots, lots of words, but no ability to illustrate that he understands what a will is. Well, Bob, who is this sitting next to you? Oh, that's my wife. You know. Um, do you love her? Yeah, no, she, she's good to me. She takes care of me. Uh, yeah, no, lots of words, but in general, that's the gist of it. So I said, Bob, when, when people die, um, you know, you, where do you want your money to go? Do you, want, do you want the government to come in and take your money and, and tell you how to spend it? Or would you like that to go to someone that you love, maybe your wife? Lots of words, but in general, he had some understanding that he wanted the money to go to his wife, not the government. And that's what I wrote in the letter. Although Bob is not able to verbalize exactly what a will is, he is able to, in general, understand that when he passes away, he wants the money to go to his family, to go to his wife specifically. And I was able to write that with a MMSD of six or seven. And I could sleep at night knowing that because I put, the, I put the context in my head. Like, what's the harm I would be doing if I was <coughs> wrong? And in this case, because I've known the family for so long, I was able to use discretion and I was able to almost, we're not supposed to do this, but with him you had to, leading questions. I asked a lot of leading questions, and I let him there. But it's basically what he wanted. In, inside that person with the six MMSE was a person that loved his wife, knows that his wife is good for him, knows that his wife won't steal his money. It's just that simple. It's a human science. It's not perfect, and you and I are allowed to do that. And to be a good doctor, 
you got to have some balls. But what about in a situation where you Then I would say this person knows not even his name. There's no way he has capacity. I would not be comfortable saying he has capacity to sign. That's what I would do. I don't know what somebody else would do. Wait, what was the question? I didn't even finish. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I answered the one about what if this was, I got the sense that this person was trying to steal his money. No, no, no. No, OK. That wasn't my OK, go ahead. Um, I answered a different was, question. What do you do in the situation where you lack that understanding of what the family situation is, and you're just assessing the patient for the first time? Oh, the first time. So you have you the have same to, situation. Yeah. Then you couldn't. You couldn't have that. I don't think you could comfortably say, okay. either, you know, because you know you don't have a relationship with them. You don't know what really is going on because you, you know you just don't. suppose anybody could sue you for anything. I was willing to take that chance in this case, just me personally. And I stand behind the tiny, tiny little shield of my opinion. Legal shield. Little tiny shield. My opinion. It is my opinion that he has the sense that he understands that when he dies, he wants his money not to go to somebody else. In my opinion, through talking to him and through asking him a series of questions, it is my opinion that he has the capacity at this time to understand what, uh, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Legally, I don't know. Suppose there is a case. Um, I mean, suppose that they could try that. Anybody would do anything for money. But I'm going to stand behind my shield of my opinion. But you don't have to. You don't have to. And I had my mentor, um, the, the person I was working under, he knew this person even longer than I did. And that was his sense too, that he's done it before for other people, that this is okay to do, or he's done it before and he, he you know, it's helped. We're here to help, but not to put ourselves on the line and, and get sued, obviously. But I, I wrote my opinion. So just write, just, just write your opinion, whatever your opinion is. And go on the stand and say, <coughs> just say, that was my opinion. I evaluated him and it's my opinion. I stand by it. That's it. They'll have a very hard time trying to nail you. And I don't care. They could come. Bring their worst. All right. Capacity is specific to a particular <coughs> decision. So we just talked about the will. And that was the only thing I talked about in that letter that he had capacity to decide. That's the only thing I was evaluating him for. And it could change over time, so theoretically, if you want to polish somebody up, you know, get them a good night's sleep, give them the right dosages of medication, clear them up, have them come in, <coughs> and then ask them about decisions, you could do that, because it changes over time, see? All right. So you could catch somebody at a good time and go through their advanced directive, couldn't you? That applies to all of you guys. When he's lucid, you could come in and ask him to do the advanced directive. That's something that could apply to you. Because it changes over time. Catch them at a good time when they're not sundowning. All right. This is just another one of those logical points, which I don't lose sleep over, but supposedly, I mean legally, in a very straightforward <coughs> talk, you're supposed to not just consider the decision to accept treatment, but also the decision. Well, the tendency here, what they're saying is the tendency here is if a person agrees to chemotherapy, we naturally think, oh yeah, that person has capacity. So really, I mean, don't we do that? Don't we do that? Like, somebody decides to have chemotherapy, we don't 
really think too much about their capacity. Or does anybody here lose sleep over somebody who agrees to chemotherapy? It's usually we get consulted for people refusing to get chemotherapy, right? Refusing to get antibiotic treatment, right? Psychiatrists, we, I mean, like the consults we get, it's hardly ever a patient's capacity to accept a certain life saving treatment. I don't know, what do you guys, you guys, no, just, this is, I'm asking you now. Does some, when somebody accepts a life saving treatment that can be very painful, nauseating, lots of suffering through the treatment, do you guys think about their capacity? Or do you think about it more when they refuse? Yeah, because we're human. So, but as a logical point, I had to point that out. But really, you really should think about it um, to, a, to a degree, to a, to a certain degree. Um, it is something you should pay attention to if you have a real concern. Uh, so I'm telling you two things, really, to kind of what's the harm if they accept the life-saving treatment and they, they're, let's say it's a gray area and they, they have, you think they have some capacity to understand chemotherapy and they sign the consent. Good, let it go, you, it's good. If they completely have zero understanding of anything that's about to happen and they're the kind of person that you put a paper in front of them, they sign it, then yeah, they may not understand how much they're gonna be suffering. So the borderline cases, you could err towards, if they sign the consent for a life-saving treatment, you don't have to worry too much about it. Only say the um, really, really um, ones that they cannot understand what they're signing, then you have to worry about their capacity to accept the painful treatments. All right, now my boss is gone, good. Want to see a roll? Want to see a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so two kinds of reason, moral reason and legal reason. Is it moral to, I mean, the, is it moral, so when I asked, would it be wrong to cut that guy's arm off, there's moral reasoning and there's legal reasoning. Legal reasoning, Joe, I think his name is Joe. Joe says very clearly, it's really no different than cutting off a penis to putting a vagina. Um, so legally, you're not gonna get dinged. But morally, do we want to use surgery to do that? Um, you know, so two kinds of reasoning to think about. We're not gonna get into the ethics of it. All right. Uh, So to sum up this, really, like we, I could give this talk in two minutes. Just figure out people's capacity um, by the degree to which they could give informed consent. Uh, oh, and, and it's based on the principle of autonomy. We want patients to have autonomy. In the United States and worldwide, actually, uh, blah, blah, blah. just we respect people's uh, uh, ability to make decisions for themselves. That's why we want to figure out if they have the capacity to determine for themselves. That's very easy to understand. Because um, we would want that for ourselves. We'd want to be able to make decisions as to what, how we want to be treated, what life-saving or life-extending um, treatments we want. Um, we want to decide how much we want to suffer to extend our lives, for example. We want that for ourselves, so we want that for our patients. Very easy to understand. And it's based on, a, and, but once the person doesn't have capacity anymore, then the principle of beneficence and non malnificence is generally the guideline that we use. In general, we accept that an informed patient is able to make their own decisions but if the patient is not able to understand that those information you're giving him, then we find somebody um, or find a way to figure out 
what is best for them. We want what's best for the patient, but they can't say how they want to choose. So our guideline is to do no harm, to do what is best for the patient. And the next slide. Um, the principle of beneficence, non malfeasance requires that an incapable person be protected from making decisions that are harmful. So uh, an incapable, per incapable person might make decisions that might be harmful to them, or that they would not make. Were they capable? So what does the law say? The law says that a patient who has capacity is entitled to make their own decisions. And then if a patient is not capable, physicians must con either A, obtain consent from a designated substitute, or to um, follow the advanced health care directive back. either find a substitute. So we've actually had this, where there's a patient on our um, ward that we've had for more than a year. We have no place for him to go. He's, his MMSE score is like a three, four. He has no place to go. He's been here a year. He hardly knows his name. He's starting to not know his name. And he needed a hernia surgery. He's not able to sign. He's not a guy that you want him to sign that he understands the risks. And, and that's the other thing, the scope of the decision. Like that money situation was fairly simple. <coughs> we're not cutting nobody, you know. We're giving money to the right person that sh it should go to. So that's not a problem. Here, we're cutting somebody open to fix their hernia. And he has no capability to understand <coughs> or to choose or to choose not to have his surgery. So what we ended up doing was finding, and you guys could do this too, and actually you guys did, surgeons did that. Um, find two physicians to decide that it's in his best interest that were he healthy, he would have chosen the surgery for hernia to fix his pain. So we did that, we sent him over here and he had surgery and now he's back with us. Two surgeons did that. See, so you guys don't need psychiatrists to do the capacity part. You guys could do it yourself. And even if we were to have done it ourselves, the surgeons would have wanted to do it themselves anyways to decide a two-physician evaluation, a two-physician hold, or a two-physician decision for capacity. And the surgeons are covered. Any questions about that? Our surgical patient? that has an MMSE of three, needed hernia surgery, and somebody substituted that decision for him. Because that's what, to our best ability, we determined that were he <coughs> able to, he would have. It's that simple. Let's not make it complicated. And in court, in court, we um, defendants are generally assumed to have capacity until the lawyers raise the issue. Well, no, in court, like a, in a criminal trial, in terms of competence, speaking, so now we're switching terms, we're switching to competence. In court, um, a criminal trial, generally, the defendants are considered competent unless the defense lawyer raises the question of competence. So that's kind of a parallel system, using it as a comparison. <coughs> you can see some parallels, because we assume an informed patient has capacity, but at the same time, we're the ones though. The difference is we're the ones to have to also look at their capacity and really believe that they have capacity to understand that paper that they're about to sign. So 
differences and uh, comparison similarities. Minors, they all need parents' consent. Well, except the New California law, you don't need your parents to know if you have an abortion, blah, blah, blah. That's, you guys finally practice how to deal with that. Right, so a minor could get really serious surgery without parental guidance. Kind of fucky, all right? All right, but there's reasons for that, I suppose. People argue, make arguments both ways. I won't commentate on that. This is where, this is where I, this is something I used with that patient with the will. My general impression. Table of patients, um, where's that general impression? Can I just see it? Yeah, general impression from a clinical encounter. My general impression of what I see when I walk into the room. My general impression. And then you have to get, because they your general impression could fool you. So do an MMSC, and that has weaknesses and, uh, and uh, uh, advantages. We'll talk about that. And then specific assessment tools that we could use. That's really useful. Pay attention to this when this comes up. Because we'll run through the cases using that standard, using that algorithm. Advantages of the mini mental, very easy. You could do it in minutes when you practice it well. You just memorize in your mind. Easy to minister, very familiar to us. We could uh, we could do I could do a mini mental, you know? But the problem some of the problems are although cognition and capacity are related, they're not exactly equal relation, <coughs> and it does not evaluate certain other cognitive functions such as judgment and reasoning, which are relevant. And, you know, so that's where you need the other tools and also your own person as a tool to measure. And it also doesn't address delusions. And delusions are very hard to <coughs> determine. Generally, the decisions have to be done without the influence of um, delusion, and it's not made under depression. Somebody's not refusing to get life-saving treatment because they're depressed and they just want to die. We'll talk about that. Where's my people? They all left? Okay. Uh, So blah, 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 blah. The A to capacity to evaluate our rating tool, our algorithm. We disclose the information relevant to the treatment decision and then the, the um, patient receives that information and then we evaluate the person's ability to understand that information. For most of our patients, it's not a problem. For most of our patients, we, we um, not assume, but we get the sense that they have the capacity. We won't do an MMSC on everybody, right, for example. Right? Yeah. I mean, who does? And we won't go through the entire ACE with every single patient, but we get a general sense. Because really, when you're in an FP clinic and you do 15 minute patients, you know, you see 25 patients in a day, you, you, you're not going to go through every step of this thing when they consent for Prozac, right? <laughs> so, but it's based on the, again, the right to autonom autonomy and self determination. We talked about that. Now, seven, here we go. This is the stuff to pay attention to because it will be helpful for you to determine capacity. Ability to understand a medical problem. Do they understand what they have? They have depression, for example, or they have a hernia, or they have a limb they want to cut off. Do they understand that? And then the treatment, do they understand treatment? These are simple. I mean, these are things that uh, are pretty obvious. We don't have to spend a lot of time on them. Do they understand alternatives? So spend a little bit of time on that, right? What's the alternative called not getting the hernia surgery? They get bigger, they might strangulate, right? You might die. 
but you have to explain their terms. You have, that's the other thing. You must, ex you must use words they could understand. So you have to actually take the time to say, you have a hernia, which is a opening your abdominal cavity wall. Maybe that's even too hard to understand. But basically, there's a hole in your tummy. If we don't use surgery, if we don't do surgery, it might get bigger, and part of your intestine might go through that hole, and it might twist, and the blood supply might get cut off, and when that happens, it's A, extremely painful, and B, you could get an infection, in fact you will, if you don't get treated, and then when you get infected, the next step it would be death, ICU. Uh, well, if you choose not to do anything, I guess you won't end up in ICU, you just, I don't know, drop dead wherever you are. <sighs> All right, so use words they can understand, and tell them the alternative. The alternative is what? Stick your finger down your abdomen and push it back? What's the alternative? You guys tell me, because I haven't done medicine in ages. What would you do other than hernia surgery to address hernia? What's their alternative? You guys are consenting patients. Come on. Yeah, what's the alternative to hernia surgery? Is there? Live with it. Okay, yeah, that's fair. No, that's fair. That is the alternative. You could say the alternative is we could just not do anything. You live with it with the possibility that you might die. You must add that. Otherwise, it's not informed consent. The informed consent requires that you go through the consequences of the chosen choices. So you tell them you could die. And they're okay with that. And you follow the other steps to evaluate capacity. They could choose to do that. They wait. That's reasonable. It can be reasonable, I mean. Anybody have any thoughts otherwise? It's not the, the statistic and probability Go of ahead. outcome. Yeah. Because you could die is mm -hmm. true for every thing you do. Okay. Good point. Good point. Use real numbers. Yeah. And depending on your patient, they might just gloss over one in two hundred thousand. Blah, 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 lots of numbers. You know, but yeah. Make it tangible, right? So 100 people in the room with hernias, how many would die if they don't get treated? Make it simple. But I don't think, I don't, I don't have it at the top of my head to be able to say how many people would die in 100. So you, if you want to go that route, rather than leave it open, then you'd have to give the real numbers. Because in court, they'll ask you. Really? You said it's 20 people in 100? Really? You said that, didn't you? And then so, but yeah, no, that's a very good thought. <coughs> make it concrete, make it tangible, make it understandable. So, do they have a reasonable ability to see the consequences of accepting the treatment? Because hernia is not, hernia surgery is not without risk. People can die from hernia surgery. People can get post-surgical infections and die from surgery. So yeah, you have to get, you kind of have to put it in context and put it in a way that they could differentiate the risk of surgery and the risk of no, not surgery. And do they have a reasonable ability to understand that? Um, and now the decision to make the the ch chosen um, modality is not based on depression. Somebody just wants to die. Because you tell them, um, if you don't get hernia surgery, one of the possibilities is that you could die. And they're depressed. They're just giving up. I don't want to live anymore. Heck, if I die, I die. They say something like that. And you have a problem. Now, they don't, now they're um, not making the decision free of depression. So, <clears throat> so then you, if you really push the, you, if, the thing is, 95% of this you could resolve by having good communication and a good relationship. But let's say you determine that his decision not to get hernia surgery is based on depression and um, they just 
choose not to have the surgery because they, th they thought you said, they thought you told them that they, they died. A, it's not a sure thing that you'll die, right? To tell them that. Because, I mean, going with the thought that they're choosing not to have surgery in order to kill themselves. You now have to make them understand that just because you refuse hernia doesn't mean you'll die either. So, <laughs> but let's say they choose not to have the surgery and it's not based on having capacity because now depression is into it and now you can't say he has capacity. If the decision is not based on something free of depression, they're choosing to not have surgery because they want to die, um, that's why they're not choosing the hernia. It's not based on a reasonable approach saying, I've suffered enough, I, I, um, I've dealt with this, this is the fifth time they want to cut me open, I don't want to go through that again, I'll take my chances with the hernia. That person has capacity, that's very easy. But the person with depression and chooses not to have the surgery, you have to get rid of the depression or you have to go to court. All right, to make it simple. Anybody have any questions about that? All right, we'll try to finish up. So again, some strengths and weaknesses. It's relatively quick. It's very easy to do clinically. Even when we just ran through the example of the patient with depression, you have to help, um, you know, get experts. Like the depression is the, you feel the depression is the reason they're choosing not to have their hernia surgery. Um, then the person does, does not have capacity. Whereas the person I said is able to say, this is the fifth time they want to cut me. I don't want it anymore. I'll take my chances. That person has capacity. See the difference? All right. So this ACE, this um, seven areas to assess, A to capacity evaluation, it's only as good as the uh, company disclosure. So like, what's your first name? Shepherd. Shepherd, uh, like Shepherd said. You have to lay out the numbers sometimes, if that's what's necessary. And the depression, the delusion can be hard to, and that's when you ask us to come in if, it, if you can't determine, and that's fine. You, we're happy to help. Um, language barriers, like my patient, there's more, the, the patient that signed the will with the six to seven, there was more inside of him that, you know, his MMSC was low, not because entirely of dementia. It was also his aphasia and his trouble understanding words, right? So, okay. So even somebody who's spoken English all their life can't have a language barrier if they have aphasia. Broca, Swanicky, uh, receptive uh, aphasia, um, What's the other one? Conduction. Huh? Conduction. Conduction. So if you're not sure, we're happy to come in and help. Now, let's go back to case example and we'll apply the ACE to a 42-year-old schizophrenic patient He's unemployed but functions independently in the community, meaning that he lives by himself, he's able to manage his SSI, SSI money on his own, he stays in his apartment all the time because paranoids do, they don't like to be around people, but, and he believes that the neighbors are breaking into the house and stealing his money when he's out the house, so he's guarding his house. Uh, we make a house call and because uh, he's so this doesn't really happen much, but this is a theoretical example. Somehow he gets to see a physician, whether the physician went to his house or somehow he came to see a physician because he was finally having a sore throat that's so terrible that he came to see. And, we, and the physician swabs and finds the infection and recommends antibiotic. Does this patient have capacity to accept antibiotic treatment? This is a patient who isolates himself, thinks the neighbors are out to get him, doesn't like to be around people. Does he have capacity to accept antibiotics? We're not asking about anything else, just asking antibiotics. So, um, well, can, let's, let's not say does, let's just say can this patient have capacity to accept antibiotics? Is there some scenarios where he can have capacity to accept antibiotics? 
And what might those be? Those situations. What, what would you want to see from him to decide? You're in FP. He comes to see you. His caretaker sits, plops him down in front of you. He says, Doc, he has a sore throat. You swab and you find an infection. And now you want to prescribe antibiotics. That's how do you function is independent when the community is not. Yeah. He doesn't have a Oh, okay. But his friend finally drags him to. Okay. He refuses to see. Let's, yeah, he good. Him on his own yeah, and he yeah. Takes an antibiotic. Yeah, and uh, so let's. Well, say in this case, this individual does not have a conservator, correct? Correct. Correct. Well, yeah. There's nothing uh -huh. stopping him. But doesn't he have delusions? He has delusions that the neighbors are breaking into his house when he's gone. But the delusions have nothing to do with his personal health care. Doesn't pertain to this decision to accept antibiotics. Perfect. Good. Yes, I'm right on. So we explain to him, you explain to him, you're the FP, that the pills are to treat a sore throat. Sometimes it can cause diarrhea or a rash. And you ask Mr. G to explain to the best of his ability what you just told him. You want, him, you want to hear in his own words what he understood from that. And ideally, you want him to be able to say, yeah, I'll I know I'll get diarrhea, I might get a rash, but not likely, in, maybe not in so many words, but in a lot of different words, but in that general sense, that gestalt of, uh, he understands that diarrhea and rash could happen, but doesn't usually happen. And Mr. G says, you're giving me these pills, you ask him to tell him in his own words. So he says, you're giving me these pills to help with, with my sore throat. If I get diarrhea or any skin problems, I should stop and let you know. Wow, right there. You have no concerns giving him antibiotics and have him consent to treatment. Because just like you guys said, it's not based on delusion. So it's very, turns out to be a very straightforward case after we considered it, con used this on rating scale, made things easy. Very easy. Now let's go back to the heart case. The real life want to take a limb off case. And we got all the things that show that he's a reasonable person. Other than this really funky thing of wanting to have a leg cut off since age 10, he is able to explain that unconsciously a leg, peg leg has become synonymous with um, with uh, happiness somehow. He's not ex able to explain how, but he knows that he's always felt that he'd be happier with the peg leg. He's able to explain that much to you. Medical science has not been able to explain that. So he, he hasn't been able to explain why, but he just knows that his happiness is linked to a peg leg. Um, and it has become a, a, a real barrier to his happiness because it it has uh, become indispensable for his personal happiness. He can't find happiness any other way. So naturally, over the years, he has thought about it. He's a smart guy. He's 65 now. He's wondered. I mean, we would wonder why we'd want to pack leg. He's thought about it for decades. He's had more personal experience than any of us, right? So naturally, over the years, I've thought of many arguments against amputation. I have considered them, and they rejected them. It's not normal, but what is normal, and who is normal? Good question. I can't answer that really. Who's normal? That's a hard question to really answer. And who can deny his um, right to happiness? So this guy sounds like he's really got it together, yet he wants a peg leg. And I'm here to tell you what to do in that case. If you want to be a surgeon that takes the leg off. There's no definite law against it. Again, you have that shield of opinion. If you can make an argument that you're doing him some good, you have your shield of opinion in court. You could block a lot of things with that shield of opinion. In your opinion, I've carefully considered Mr. G's case. He understands, blah, blah, blah. He's dealt with it for this number of years, just throwing all that stuff. And I've come to the opinion that the risk and benefit of the leg removal outweighs, the risk outweighs the 
the benefit outweighs the risk. Just say that in your opinion. And I think you could honestly do that because we do that for sex changes. So legally, you're not going to get dinged. Any questions? But morally, that's for you to decide. There is a doctor, Robert Smith, that actually did that in 2002. He did two amputations on perfectly healthy people. And what happened to him? Did anything happen to Mr. Dr. Smith? No. Legally, no. But because you work at ARMC, are you going to do amputation? Let's say you determine you're just like Dr. Smith. You've done a year and a half of research, which, which he did before his first amputation. Let's say you did all that and you decide, yes, the benefits outweigh the risk. Would you do that at ARMC? See, there's other consideration. You wouldn't. Because Dr. Muley will kick your butt. So you wouldn't do that here because it's a controversial procedure. You don't bring controversy to, the, to this workplace. If you want to open your own hospital, go ahead and do it. But you're not going to do it here at ARMC. So I don't know. Do you guys like that answer? Well, I'm just raised the point that just because no legal yeah, action exactly. was brought up yeah. doesn't mean yeah. that it couldn't have been. It seems it seems in the situation it could have been. He's yeah. he's fortunate that he did it on patients. I think they would have had a very hard time prosecuting him. Okay. Yeah. So that's maybe why there's no case. But hospital ARMC does not want to get in the news. He works for another hospital, so his trustees told him knock it out. Don't do any more here. It's not appropriate for this hospital. Just like abortions are legal, we don't do it here. Do we? We don't, really. Right. I don't, I don't think we do them here. Controversy. We, so yeah, but if you want to open your own hospital, do it. I think legally, you could do that. Morally, I wouldn't want to. That's me. So to wrap things up, um, this ACE thing is the most important thing you should take away from this. That's it. And then when it comes to religion, numbers count. Don't hit, uh, I'm not religious. Uh, I'm quoting somebody from a book. When one person has a delusion, it's a psychiatric disorder. When millions of people have a delusion, it's a religion. You're okay. That's it.